Welcome all to Lunar Alchemy, working with the archetypes and elements. Today we are working with the Nourisher, Gene Key 27, and that leads us from the shadow of selfishness to the city of selflessness, <laughs> and it's the way of altruism. Um, yeah, welcome everybody. So let's talk about this particular gene key or this archetype. Um, the hexagram looks like a mouth, but it also, um, which is kind of where some of the insight into this particular energy comes from. And um, when I look at it, it also, to me, resembles a, the symbol of an O or a circle, which is a symbol for wholeness. And so, Bella, I wonder what type of insights you have about this archetype that can um, kind of bring this element of wholeness forward or of this um, this aspect of this energy that leads us in that direction yeah we were in a call a community called right before with most of the people that that you see mm -hmm. here and i i got the dolphin you know the dolphin seem mm -hmm. to be more advanced than we are in some way and they are they are living in pods and they sometimes do these things together like even dying together they seem to just mm -hmm. have understood what it is to to be together and do together and and also the pleasure of life I, I believe they say that the dolphins are the only other species than the human that they think are are engaging in love making for this for the pleasure of it not just mm -hmm. for for the biology of it yeah that's a uh the the aspect of the pod is an interesting one in relationship to this gene key because it describes both a collective mind as well as individual minds existing simultaneously and it's almost like a dolphin has two separate modes going on concurrently one where each dolphin shares all of their thoughts together and also their own individual thoughts going on that drive each member of the pot. And um, I think it would be interesting to um, consider what is, what's the difference in humanity with the between these two separate modes of thinking like how how do we come to share our thoughts in a deeper way um with each other that we could actually build that kind of a pod mindset and is it even possible in our current bodies um i think that's an interesting question to consider All right. So Bella, tell me more about this archetype from the standpoint of an individual. How does an individual come into this, you know, it's called the nourisher, which, you know, it's, it's like, uh, to me, that, that title or that name or that uh, umbrella for this energy, it feels like um, someone who gives, but in a specific way, someone who gives with, a, with an awareness of exactly what is needed by other individuals. How do we how do we do something like that? How do we come into that kind of an awareness? Or how can this archetype guide us forward? 
Yeah, what I felt was important in the call right before was to actually become aware of the geometry that we have in ourselves, in our own perception of giving and receiving. And also that many of us don't have really good role models that have a balance in the giving and receiving and, and that natural kind of infinity eight that, that it is if we, if we look at the energy in a bigger, in a bigger perspective. Um, yeah, for me, that is the first step to become aware of our own geometry and also our own preference, because as, as long as you have a preference between giving and receiving, it's almost like the, the beauty of either giving or receiving can't completely unfold because you have a preference for being a giver or, re, or, or a receiver more than anything. And I was also sharing in the call before about, I feel like receiving ourselves sometimes it can it can also be in the relationship with ourselves and i believe it always starts there the, the same thing as in in human design we start with with the individual circuitry and then we have the tribal and then we have a collective and somehow they they build on each other as as the lines in the hexagram so for me this is the very basis here we are in in the tribal circuitry and i see in the chat as well we do have uh, when we look at the smile that goes from the from the sacral in the middle and then out to the emotional and out to the spleen, uh, is how it's how we make babies and how they grow up to be responsible citizens or tribe members. So in here, it is that knowing what's needed to get to nurture the children so that they can go, grow up. And the harmonic eight is the fifty. So it's the values that we're that we are the nurturing and the values that we are passing on is what happens here between the sacral and the spleen. Mm. Mm. So I I agree that. The 27 in, in its highest higher expression definitely knows what's needed. A little bit similar to the 19 somehow. They know what's needed. They are tribal and they know they know for survival and for nourishment. You know. Mm. Yeah, it's it strikes me that um, it would require a deep, deep, deep individual knowledge that takes you kind of beyond your own uniqueness you know once you reach some level inside of universality of of recognizing kind of the the roles of each of your own cells in the different parts of your body and and cultivating an awareness of what the needs of those cells are you know understanding the cycles. Um, when I think about how cycles of life and death impact our individual choices and how we uh, function as a society, it often makes me think about how most of our healthcare system, at least in the US, is geared towards extending life and it seems as if if we think about the life of a cell like a the cycle of a the life cycle of a cell sometimes we need to for our own health we need to allow cells that have kind of moved through their entire cycle to um to be washed away to be cleared out and to me that doesn't necessarily suggest that our goal for health should always be to extend the cycle of life for every single cell that we have and that kind of like puts us up against, you know, that idea puts us up against a, a potentially challenging perspective, especially from the viewpoint of selfishness when it comes to each human individual as a cell of the larger human organism. And, you know, one of one of the things that you mentioned about the dolphins in the pod is that sometimes 
in order to save a younger member of the pod, a, an older uh, member might sacrifice itself so to ensure that younger member's continuation. And it just, there's a, there's a level of wisdom that I think comes in that it's like deeper than we can have as an individual thinking as an individual and because somewhere inside that genetic drive toward selfishness that drive toward self-preservation toward survival is so strong in us as individuals and somehow there's a wisdom also available to us that kind of can allow us to look more deeply at us as a species or as a culture or as a family or community. And it feels like there's there's this wisdom developing that, like you said, we don't necessarily have a large number of role models kind of serving as an example. And I wonder if there's a way that we could have that that isn't based on, um, that isn't based in the field of selfishness. Is there, is there a way that we can create a model for this altruistic giving that actually works in today's world, the way that it functions? You know, you mentioned that cycle of the infinity sign. And when I think about the overall movements of the economy in our world, we don't often see that continuous flow. We see a lot of kind of one directional flow and then kind of a lot of trickling in, in the same direction instead of having this sort of, um, sort of constant, constant flow. And I wonder if, if the way that we relate with money has a lot to do with this also. Yeah, that's a good question. I would say in the Gene Keys, when Richard speaks about this, he doesn't that much relate it to money, but more those kinds of basic survival thing because it's tribal and it's within the tribe to get the nurturing you need to, to survive in the tribe. Um, and definitely when it comes to giving and receiving, I believe that you know, money is just one of those energies, giving and receiving, and it's that, that medium that we have chosen to pay for things or exchange with um you know there is a little bit of that that i feel that from the from the shadow frequency it's like taking a jump to the gift frequency from the shadow frequency is it's usually not a place you know that we can just change that's why like for me it's often feeling the shadow inside of, of me inside of my body and daring to feel it that and then there is a door that I can't that I can't imagine that opens the possibility of something different and I do believe it starts with the individual I, I believe that when in when we change in the individual that's when we change in the tribe and that's when the collective is changing I don't actually think that the collective is going to really kind of change down on an individual level and and I guess too that human design especially is speaking about that it's the individual that wakes up and we have spoken about that so many times that the mutation happens in the individual circuitry especially in this middle pillar six the 60 and the three and then the two and the 14 and uh, the one and the eight the 23 43 where we have the nodes right now and then the 61 and the 24 so I believe that it has to do with our own energy circulation and our own life force. And when we feel that we are pillars of, of, of energy uh, that connect the sky and the earth, 
I, I feel like we kind of even decide to get out of the systems. Um, and, and it doesn't even, it doesn't even become such a big thing anymore. I mean, I, I feel myself quite out of the system already. And then the, of course it's gonna knock on the door because then you need to rent an apartment or then you need, you know, and then you realize that you're in the system again. But I do believe that more and more we can build those pods that are actually not depending on if we think the 53 and the 54 the greed and the immaturity in thinking that, you know, it has to look look the way that it has in the exchanges or the stock market or no it won't it won't continue to look the same so for me it comes back to the individual the inner resource the inner circulation of energy uh, and when when we feel abundant in that and when we start to shift and change and mutate through that i believe we come together differently and i also believe that all of us here you know, today there, there, there are people from the inner circle that are joining this on the inside. Well, there is a resonance here. So for me, that is how we build our human pods that, you know, somehow is, is beautiful in a similar sense than the, than the dolphins. And, and hopefully here we don't have to sacrifice anybody, but all of us can come together and see the synergy of, of coming together. Mm. Yeah, so the the movement of an individual in a particular direction let's say in the direction and in an altruistic direction when one individual begins to feel that reality for themselves and begins to vibrate that more powerfully through their choices and their thoughts and feelings and expressions that energy kind of impacts the people that are around them in some subtle way. And what maybe what part of what you're suggesting is the way that we're able to come together through the internet today in whether it's in social media groups or um, groups like the inner circle where there's a resonant focus for that individual pathway will begin to discover more and more and more how our collective can function in new ways. And maybe, maybe part of that inner exploration is will automatically be reflected in that outer explore, exploration where people come together and new ideas arise and new possibilities come about simply by nature of us coming together. Um, <laughs> we have a, 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 Jeremy mentioned about the 59 coming in and I think that's an, an interesting way to look at this because um, when you consider selfishness and how it functions through a person, you know, looking out for, what do they say, looking out for number one, <laughs> you know, there's, there's an inherent uh, hierarchy involved in, in the in that viewpoint. And when we look at Gene Key 59, the, there's, a, there's a kind of a dishonesty around looking at ourselves in that particular way. We haven't, we haven't examined all of the ways that we function yet. And it's almost like that 59 comes out of a, a, that deep self-exploration, the potential for it anyways, where intimacy can kind of blossom out of the awareness of the self and what does actually nourish us. You know, when we recognize what true nourishment is, then 
intimacy can kind of naturally happen because we're aware of what it is that we need rather than attempting to manipulate what we need, getting it from another person, which, which is where most of our relationships kind of start to create conflict and have problems because of that lack of the intimacy. I think that's a, that's a really fantastic point. Um, so Bella, this, I'm intrigued by this idea of the smile between the sacral and, and the solar and the spleen. And I wonder if you could tie in maybe some of the movements of those energies to this discussion of nourishment, because one of the things about nourishment that we know is we can experience a need and we can go out and take action to fulfill that need, but we may not necessarily satisfy that need in in what we seek we sometimes create more needs by a, a greater experience of lack of nourishment in that seeking that we that we follow so how does this kind of play in with these other centers creating this sort of swoop across the bottom yeah, I feel the simplest way of seeing it is that we were living, like I said, in tribes before, and then we needed to make babies and those babies need to survive because if we don't have a new generation, the tribe can't survive. So that is the basic way that we would explain this sacral smile and the sacral smile would go, like we said, from the sacral, we would have the 59, no, no this, yeah, the 59 and the uh, 27 pointing out, and then they would meet on each side uh, from the spleen, the 50, and from the emotional center, the six. So that's what we call the sacral smile. And for example, Richard Rudd has this whole, his whole smile in his chart. Um, mm -hmm. In a low frequency in the society we live in today, where it's not really about the tribe. Yeah, you kind of have to fit in. You kind of have to like, you know, it's easy to think that we need to do all the things that we, that we do by conditioned, as conditioned by, the, by society, which would have to do with, you know, I have to give so that I'm accepted, so that I can receive, or I give, I give in order to receive, like with, with the 27 is where, where, where we could be at. The six could be wall, setting up walls, avoiding conflict. The, the 59, like we said, it's not capable of intimacy because it's capable of making babies, you know, in a way. So like the six says no, and the, the, the 59 forces it itself. And then sometimes there are babies, you know, hopefully the babies are supposed to, to get birth, but all this in, in the level of awareness that we are now to function at such low frequency would be corrupt for where we are at, because there is a higher awareness. So for me, what we are seeing is that now it's not only to make babies and to have these babies survive. Like what we have in this smile is a, is a completely new way of existing together, which is living through much more transparency and, and understanding what true nurturing is, which is actually even beyond giving and receiving in the geometry of that. But I, do, I did feel in the call before that we all have something, a residue from that geometry that our, our lineage, the, the persons, the people who were right before us didn't completely um resolve so i do feel we all have some residue in that geometry where there's still no still not a completely uh balanced geometry um i wonder i feel like it's always both sides which side of the six and the 59 has like the most important window in is this is it intimacy that creates values and true nurturing or is the values and true nurturing that can help us to relate in a completely different way where we don't have to kind of be in friction with each other. So, and I, and I believe it is, it is both ways, but this is, again, remember that these are very basic human needs. So how do we, 
how do we balance again basic human needs with a high level of awareness and i often always kind of say that is about embodiment so how are we embodying those different frequency the the 27 in a higher frequency which is the nurturer the the 50 which is the maestro that has this aura that brings harmony wherever it goes and then the 59 that is here to play and to and to kind of get under the skin but not just sexually in all kinds of ways uh and then the six that can feel when something is off and can bring that to attention or not even bring it to attention but just walk into a room and calibrate what's there so mm. the embodiment of these keys for me is the is the bridge from like the very basic to actually embodying a higher level of awareness. Yeah, when you're speaking, it made me think of the um, the suggestion of how parents kind of nourish their children within that first seven year cycle and how the presence of both father and mother is so important for a sort of a balanced um, providing of of structure for that development and you know anytime there's imbalance experienced by a child there's always more opportunities the next cycle will come around in their development and give an opportunity to um, work those out in one way or another. But in this uh, idea of um, raising frequency, it seems that part of our individual focus has to move into that collective level where because within our society you know there are very few examples of of a, a parents a, a man and a woman for instance who have a child together and who are able to simply devote all of their time to the upbringing of that child are our children are being brought up in daycares and in schools and um, to some degree by social media. I mean, you know, three-year-olds have like full control over watching YouTube videos. You know, it's like the, the amount of um, media that a person can consume is now hundreds or thousands of times greater than it was before the internet existed. And so, um, you know, like the way that we are engaging in this process, it seems as if there's a, an opening possible in the way that we are considering how our how children are going to be raised and develop into the next stage. And, you know, perhaps our, uh, our individual goals with our children, for those of us that have them, um, is, is in a process of transforming in some way that supports this 27 to expand. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. I posted something in the group today, in the bigger group with the 27 and, and children needing both male and female to, I actually think I have it here. And it, it seemed to kind of create some reaction. Um, it was, any child who, who receives true nurturing from both the male and the female in their first seven years will have a strong physical, emotional, and mental constitution. 
So that is from the 27th gene key. And there were several people saying, oh, we should have said fe female or feminine energies and masculine energies. This shouldn't say female and male. This is wrong. And actually one person is here to embody both. And it was, I thought it was interesting because, because we are looking at this very primitive um, circuitry. And I think that somehow we, we mutate and evolve little by little. So I do feel that it's here, it's not just like, oh, you have one parent that is in sacred union and then you are fine. No, like I, I think we're more primitive than that. I also feel like we need to learn about the, by the outer example of that union between two beings where one is more in the masculine core and one is more in the feminine core. I believe that. So, so for me to think that we evolve so fast so we can suddenly, one person can do everything. Like I'm saying, like I said before, I think it starts with each one of us, but there's also geometry in how we come together. And as of now, when we are this kind of being, a human being, it actually takes a woman and a man to create a child. And just by like simple, like simple kind of conclusion that those two beings are there to support a child, at least for the seven first years. That for me, you know, doesn't seem like rocket science and doesn't seem like any needs to, to say that it's so good to do in some other way. Because I think that most of us, you know, that have felt either had our own parents or didn't have our own parents and so our friends having their parents or not. You know, I, I think that we can just go back to our own childhoods and see the consequences, good or bad, that those different constellations have, have had on us and our friends. Yeah. One of the things that came up for me while you were speaking about the man and the woman and this sort of um, move, movement or awareness that is growing of the inner uh, union of masculine and feminine energies. One of the things that I think is really important to recognize, particularly with this archetype in mind, is that each human being is not designed to become a hermaphrodite as a, as a physiological being. This idea of the hermaphrodite, which is Hermes and Aphrodite combined, the masculine and the feminine, they is a spiritual concept and as such is not physical in nature. And when we look at the integration of our masculine and feminine natures, we have to also recognize those energies as they exist within our phys physiological body. And while there are some people who are alive on the planet that kind of tend toward a much more, uh, a, a very, very equal balance of those energies. The, the form that, that your biology sort of takes on, there is an energy running through the system that carries that particular charge and it is needed to be nurtured in, in a very powerful way, regardless of the way in which your personality functions. So let's say there's a man who is extraordinarily feminine in behavior, in personality, in um in just the manner of operation. The function of that feminine energy is about working through the conditioning of that system. However, the physiological body of the man requires a masculine energy running through it in order to function at its most optimal degree or its utmost well being. And that doesn't mean that the personality effects should be changed or transformed. 
in some way, but that the physical body needs that type of nurturing. So what I'm saying is that the, the physiological form that we have and the ego relationship that we have with who we've become, our personality, can have different degrees of these energies functioning within them. And that part of nourishing oneself as an individual involves a deep knowing, a deep understanding, a deep exploration of how these energies work within us and honoring those energies for what they truly are to the best of our ability, of course. <laughs> you know, um, I think the efforts that we make to evolve in, in this type of way are, are always moving us forward on our paths. Um, and, but I think, you know, sometimes within this idea of the masculine and feminine blending together, there are sometimes, um, you know, women who are attempting to engage more of their feminine energy are finding a challenge of blending their masculine directed personality in with this new energy. And there can arise some um, conflict in, in that experience, internal conflict, where a woman may, may say, I'm not enough of a goddess or whatever, you know, the image is in the way that they behave. And that type of a, an awareness, it, it, from my perspective, is, is not exactly, I mean, it's a process. But, but if we engage in saying, oh, I'm just supposed to be this powerful masculine energy and I'm just going to protect and, you know, support and provide and do all those things because I'm a man, we're not going to quite get to that stage of wholeness that we're seeking. Um, well, it's so funny that, I mean, maybe not funny, but uh, I think it's really interesting that the the sort of aspect of masculine and, and feminine kind of popped up in this discussion. And, and I wonder if maybe that's a wonderful opening, like, like a gateway that we can begin to approach that exploration and understanding of nourishment. And I wonder if you have any, um, you know, extra insight about how we can engage with those you know, and particularly with the, the energy that perhaps we feel less familiar with, you know, perhaps for if you've been living your life in a masculine form all the way, how do we engage with our feminine quality? If we've been engaging in a feminine way our whole life, how do we nourish what exists of the masculine without kind of bringing about an imbalance within ourselves yeah with this key again because it's the foundation the basics the the tribal i would actually go back to basics and for most of us it is it is that if we are in a feminine body we have a feminine core if we are in a masculine body we have a masculine core that is that is what the tribe at least was relying on in order to survive Right. And I feel like there has been a lot for a long time spoken about the divine feminine because the feminine was repressed for many thousands of years and through religion and culture and everything, it started, it started, it needed to, to come, to start to come to balance. So we have spoken a lot about the feminine rising and we can see that. And we have been able to engage for at least the, the few the few last decades in a lot of these groups if you are gonna if you're going to understand more about the divine feminine you can google and there's a lot out there <laughs> i feel like there is much less about the divine masculine 
Because if the feminine is rising, the masculine is rising too. We cannot have one without the other. And because there was so much repression, I feel like when one's come up and suddenly now both are alive, there is a lot, there is a lot of fertility for the masculine to also rise. And for me, the masculine rising, that's, that's the pioneer. As, as much as the women were pioneering, I think for women, it was more like every, all of us remembering the beauty of the feminine and the function of the feminine that was there long before the masculine kind of took over which wasn't the masculine fault so the masculine did that to the feminine it was exactly how we have set it up in order to evolve right but now now it's the time for the masculine to to meet with the feminine and it's not the same masculine that that was immature before and that made all the wars and the havoc in a way the way we often see it so for me i think that the exploration now is to feel into the core of that being and have experience of that with the other where we can actually be you know where we want to rise together rather than you know make because the feminine has also in the last in the last hundred years at least made the man wrong for many things because the pendulum always has to swing to the other side so for me true nurturing comes from experiencing that union between the masculine and the feminine and I believe like I I can just speak about you know I think there has been it's very simple here I think there has been too much focus on on masculine ejaculation right everything the whole porn industry is masculine ejaculation what about feminine ejaculation what about the water goddess archetype 29 that comes from the sacral and it's, it's ready to go to the abyss with the other, to see the man and go with the man or the masculine wherever it needs to go in order to rise up together and commit together and be wholehearted and say, yes, that is the journey. So for me, we need that water goddess to come in and to say yes, and to receive the, the masculine wholeheartedly because she has actually had more years to pre- pre- prepare for the, the journey that we're doing together. And I do say this journey happens in within each one of us but it's also so important to live it out in this body with the other polarity i as a woman there is nothing more healing and more nurturing that i have experienced in my life so i don't want to say anybody oh just do the inner journey no do the outer journey find that find that you know i say it's like precious twin that precious twin that is your polarity that dares to go there to feel everything with you everything that has been repressed for thousands of years that when you come in together and when you dare to open the waters the 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 waters that that you know the water and the blood somehow and the alchemy that happens when we when we go there i i feel it's it's a remembrance but it's also when we come together, it's an it's a, an awakening to something that's never been there before, and that could not happen with only the feminine awakening. It's impossible. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. It's and you know it's interesting within the context of of sexual interaction how how deeply that that interaction and the way that our biology functions along with what you're suggesting in that exploration around how does um, how does how do the waters of our sexual bodies function it really brings that self knowledge point forward in harmony with the other polarity where you know from a from a certain standpoint the masculine energy conservation is one of the most important qualities for the the kind of development of potency and potency is one of the most important qualities of that masculine energy itself which kind of implies that the releasing of masculine waters or ejaculation for instance is something that that has greater potency the less frequently it occurs and in this idea of bringing up children in this nourishing environment it's almost as if a reversal of the ways in which our sexual interactions have occurred for 
hundreds or maybe even thousands of years needs to be part of that exploration. Um, probably amongst many, many other ways that we can explore these energies emotionally and, and even mentally. Um, because, you know, within those emotions, we can find that feminine quality within our mental thinking, we can find that masculine quality and applying all of those elements within. Um, really looks like a, a huge potential for alchemy, which, um, speaking of which, I think we should probably wrap up here and move on to the aspect of the the alchemy that we're exploring with our solar members. So um, I want to thank everyone for joining us for this discussion and for, um, for your contributions on the chat. Um, I think your collective energy, your pod, I really think it, it steered this conversation in ways that certainly I couldn't have predicted um, and, and I think that the question that I er early on asked about, well, how do we, how do we move from an individual thinker to a collective thinker and have that kind of happening? I feel like we're actually doing this in the moment, um, perhaps without realizing it totally consciously as it's occurring, because we don't have access to everything that's going to happen or the directions we're going to shift and move and how we're going to feel in response to your presence. Um, yeah, and I want to say well. one thing that is like, that is kind of going into where we're going. I don't think this is prescribed by you and the kind of alchemist you are, but I always, I have the 28 two times in my Jupiter and my moon. So Two days ago, I did the transmission of the seven, of the 13, of the 39, and the 62 right after each other. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> it was pretty powerful. So I don't know. That's... <laughs> but I can say when I did them like that, you were speaking about potency. And yeah, I don't know, like I, it actually did exactly that thing. Like I said, in order for something to leave or in order for something to trans, like in order for something to be worked, you need to feel it. And I can say that I felt everything that I feel, you know, I have all these keys and that's also why I chose them. It's my North mm. Node, it's my radiance and my purpose. And it's also my ascendant and my other North Node. So all that in one. So I can, yeah, if, if people wonder if the transmissions are powerful, I can, promise you that if you do four in a row that are your own keys they are very powerful i don't know if it's suggested but if you're you can yeah i i love that you brought that up bella because i know some of our solar members um you know kelly mentioned she does the marathons um i, I know that that sometimes when you bring them all together there is that this synergistic effect and occasionally when a person engages with the transmissions there's there's not a deep feeling in every case of the power that is occurring because it exists on such a subtle level and the reason we're engaging with the elemental levels within these now is to bring it into a, a somewhat deeper, um, almost physical experience. Um, but when, when someone reaches a certain degree of, of their own energies rising to a certain point that they are not quite able to move beyond on their own, these energies allow for that kind of extra extra potency that moves us into a new stage and for for anyone who has access to multiple uh, transmissions they can be used in that in that manner to get a very visceral experience of of the power 
of what is transforming inside. Um, although I, I always do like to say, you know, if, if you ever engage in those um, the sort of like masses at once that you're prepared for what happens afterwards, because, um, you know, sometimes if we're carrying some potent shadow energy within us, um, it's not going to hide anymore. <laughs> so, um, you know, you just want to be emotionally and mentally prepared for what happens um, in that process. Yeah, Terry, melting is a great word for that. Although occasionally, um, you know, it, it can kind of feel like an unleashing of, of negativity in our experience, which really just has to do with the mechanics of how the energy transmutes out of our form um, and through our awareness. Um, it's yeah, not really- One more thing that I put in the chat about uh -huh. that as well, which is, you remember how I was saying, and I think I'm saying this because you guys in the inner circle are here and I kind of want to explain. I was saying to John before, when we do the transmission, I would like us to kind of end there and not come back on and speak about it so that everybody can have their own experience. And I thought that that was the solution. And now I realize as, well, as I'm writing in the, in the chat to all of you, that it wasn't actually that the main thing. The main thing is that somehow we are a pod mind. We are a hyper, I don't know, collective. So for me, when we're doing these, transmissions on the call that we're soon going to go into with with everybody's in the membership um i am still so tuned in to the container of all of us that i can't really really let go and somehow with that 28 you know that is individual that is my purpose so you know that is like me i have a lot of individuality and that's also kind of where i I guess where I tune into and where my mutation happens. I, I, I'm not, I have not been able on the calls, even if I know that I can turn off my camera and I can go wherever, I have not been able to go to like completely with that 29, commit so much to the process as when I'm alone in the night and most people are sleeping. I have a completely open emotional center, a completely open ego center, have some openness in my chart, head and ajna. So it can also be, be that. Um, but for me, the night is something that I love because I don't feel all the auras and I, I, I feel in a space where I can go really deep because I don't have to like be prepared for ever kind of gets thrown at me or something like that energetically. So that's my experience. And I guess for, for those of you that are, that, that are with us, you know, it's just a, yeah, a suggestion to at least one of them, maybe not four in a row, uh, where there's very little energy of other auras around you, whether on online or in, in the space, and just see the difference, how your body interacts with the transmissions. Yeah, thank you for that, Bella. One of the qualities that you're describing of going deep is about meditation. And while Often in the West, we learn about meditation as something that an activity that you do. Um, the deeper that you get into a practice of it and the deeper you explore it, the more you begin to realize that meditation simply describes the state of being rather than an activity. And the transmissions bring about that state. And when you give yourself into that state, you have a much greater access to your entire being, which is kind of, I think, part of what Bell is describing of the feeling of, of self, you know, in this exploration of self and not self that we're involved in. Meditation is extraordinarily powerful because it is a full immersion with self. And in that immersion, we begin to recognize what is not self. What is this concept of other? And uh, I think really powerful for that reason. So um, let's conclude our discussion and move to our secondary um, uh, Zoom room for our solar members. You can click on the transmission link 
um, to join us there. And I want to thank each of you for being with us. Um, we hope to see you again next week or a future discussion that you feel um, intrigued to join us for. We love having you with us all. And I'm sending loving presence from my heart to each of yours. Uh, till next time, we'll say bye bye for now, and we'll meet the solar members in uh, the transmission portal in just a few moments.